Good afternoon and welcome to episode 6 of Funny Like a Clown Podcast. I am your host, Dennis Worth. That's episode 6 you're tuned into. It is December 5th, 2018. And uh, we're here to make you laugh. We're here to amuse you. It's a comedy show. And on the phone, I have comedian, actor, known for such uh, television shows as Trapper John M.D., Remington Steel, Newhart, The Jeffersons, MASH, Married with Children, The Wonder Years, Night Court, Knight Rider, Too Close for Comfort, Days for Our Lives, the list goes on and on. We have actor Sandy Helberg. Sandy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun doing some of those comedies, like Days of Our Lives. Yeah, if I, if I ever do a movie, I want you on my team. You're a veteran of the veteran, aren't you? Right, so, well, that was one of my first points I wanted to get to, was when I Googled you at first, it came up, but uh, some of the Google sites have you as passed away, and unless I have a phone line to the other side, you're you're very much alive, correct? Yes, where was that? Was that on IMDb? It was on uh, Google, on one of the Google sites, I don't know, I mean, how, how do you think that got there? Do you think it was one of your friends pulling a joke, or <laughs> just... Yeah, it was probably uh, someone in my family. You don't know how it got there, right? You're very much alive, so... Yeah, I would never have buried myself now. Well, you know, Andy Kaufman tried to pull that off. He always wanted to fool the media into thinking he had passed away and come back from the dead. But you pulled it off. You've done it. So, whether it was by accident or not... We're still waiting for him to come back. That's right. It'll be a while before we see Andy, but... um. So let's take it back to the beginning. You were born in Frankfurt, Germany, correct? Yes, I was. And your parents were uh, both Holocaust survivors who actually met in a concentration camp. And boy, you could make a movie about that story itself. But what are some of your childhood memories about the Holocaust or dealing with that? With that? Well, I wasn't in the Holocaust, but uh, I was about a year old when we came to this country. And uh, we came to Ohio because we had a sponsor who was going to uh, sponsor our family and help us get set up and stuff because uh, I certainly wouldn't have chosen Toledo, Ohio. What was life like for you in Toledo? <laughs> uh, terrible. It was, uh, there was still a lot of anti-Semitism, you know, and here I was, this little shoe boy with big ears and, and big nose and big glasses and big hair. And, uh, I, uh, my parents only spoke Yiddish to me, so when I started school, I sounded like Jackie Mason. Really? I sounded like this. Let's play baseball. I hit the ball. I run around the bases. I go over here. You watch the ball. And these rednecks would look at me and say, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> Trying to figure you out, right? Yeah, you know. So uh, they did let me play baseball. I played uh, home plate. So, um, but, but it was very difficult. There was a lot of anti-Semitism went all the way through high school. So it was an adjustment period uh, for you. Well, from uh, instant to this, you had to grow up my whole life, uh, you know, at least in that part of my life. Uh, they used to call me Hitler, which was my nickname because they knew I was born in Germany. And really? They used to, yeah, they used to call the house. My father would answer and they'd ask for Hitler. It made him very unhappy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, like I said, cause the, way, the only way I survived was I wasn't a great student because I didn't care. I wasn't an athlete because I was too small. And somehow I was funny. And it was like a self-defense and a way to attract girls. And my father had a very sarcastic sense of humor, and, and that's where I got it from, I think. So after, after uh, Toledo, you relocated to New York. I mean, what was that part of, do you think that's why you found comedy? Is just as, as an escape from the hate that you had to find some good in this world, that there was something to laugh about? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I did all the variety shows and talent shows, and, uh, uh, you know, and then it began to get some friends from that. But I don't know, I just always wanted to be an actor, even as a kid. There was nowhere in my family, so... Uh, after high school, uh, I went to New York and studied acting. And for me, the big shock, the culture shock, was when I got to New York, there were Jews everywhere. So you I fit right in. Down the street, and there were Jews. And I look, hey, a Jew? Are you? Are you a Jew? I'm a Jew. Look at look at these Jews. So it was a lot more comfortable for you than Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> Yeah, it was the antithesis of where I came from, and 
and again, that's where the arts were and the acting and uh, doing some stand-up at the beginning. What was that like for you doing stand-up comedy? Were you a hit right off or was it difficult? You found a group for yourself. Uh, yeah, one man group, two man group. <laughs> and, but You were performing, place. which you know a lot of people don't, but. Absolutely. There was a place in the village, a uh, coffee house, and they had in the back this like a little nightclub that they never used, and they let us use it. They said, you can have it, and we did shows every night. We would, we were able to get people in. You know, I don't think we charged it, anyone. And, right. uh, if you can just get them in the door, that's half the battle, right? <laughs> and, Nobody messed uh, with him. Uh, uh, right, so he would sleep in there, and we came in one night, and he was sound asleep on the stage. And we figured, well, he'll wake up. You know, you don't want to wake. No, don't, 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 don't disturb him, right? <laughs> <laughs> How did that work out? We never, it was funny. We never mentioned him to the audience like he was part of the set. And we did an entire show around him. And he never woke, he up, never woke up during the show? No. Wow. Were people no, clap? Wow. <laughs> and it was an interesting reaction by the audience. Sometimes they laughed and sometimes they weren't sure. They weren't sure what to make of it, right. Now, what made you move out to L.A.? What, 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 was, what inspired that move? Well, it's like most actors, that's where the work is. I mean, right. New York, there was a lot of theater and stuff, and that, which I liked, but it was a tough uh, group to crack. And, uh, well, L.A. is no easier. L.A. will chew you up and spit you out. I mean, how did, how did things go for you when you hit L.A.? Again, the groundling? Groundlings. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff being like mad. People came from the out there. Will Ferrell, Phil Hartman, Melissa McCarthy. It was really one of the first, uh, uh, other than like Second City in the committee, it was one of the first bigger uh, improvisational groups. When I joined, uh, it was like five people. So it was a place to get you ready. You're in, baby. There you go. Well, I know there's a lot of actors who give their left arm just to be in one of the, you know, hit shows that you've been on, and you, you have quite the list, but I know uh, one of your big breaks is uh, working with Mel Brooks. You were in movies such as High Anxiety, History of the World Part 1, and Spaceballs with him. How, how did that all come about with Mel Brooks?
actor his name is Jack Riley. I don't know if you know who he is, but uh, he used to be on the old uh, Bob Newhart show. He played Mr. Carlin, the really kind of disturbed patient. But anyway, he was a friend of Mel's and was in some of Mel's films. And he said, would you like to meet Mel Brooks? And I thought he was kidding. <laughs> yeah. He said, yeah. He, I mean, just like out of nowhere. And he set it up. And I go to Mel's office at Fox and... Uh, go into his office and it's like uh, from the from the door his desk is like a block away i mean it's such a big fucking office and you're nervous and to I begin walk. with so that's a long ass walk right <laughs> i'm walking and walking and thinking you know and he's looking at me not thinking he's watching me walk i can't entertain him while i'm walking he's what's he thinking what's he sweating. thinking yeah and i'm sweating and by the time i sit down I looked like I had just run a marathon, and uh, we started to talk, and, you know, he was just uh, so warm and, and, and open, and... Uh, was he as funny off-camera uh, as he is on camera? Yes, he made me laugh. He was a character. I, okay. And I thought, oh, okay, here we go, and so I started to make him laugh, and I, you know, to me, it was like, I got up, and I said, okay, I'm going to go. He said, where are you going? I said, I've made you laugh. Uh, my life is complete. I can get out of show. What else is there when you make Ida laugh, right? That's right. I, he said, sit down. And uh, we talked some more, and he said, uh, but he never had me audition. So it was just through the talking. And just so through the conversation, said, right? Uh, yeah. He said, you know, he came in here for a small part. I like you. I'm going to give you a bigger small part. So uh, that was the... Uh, part and high anxiety. It wasn't a big part, but I got to work with him. You worked with the legend, on. yeah. And, you know, he let me improvise pretty much, you know, and so that's, and then he called me uh, next time he did the movie, a uh, movie which was uh, History of the World. And in that movie, originally, uh, I played Einstein, he played Hitler, and the guy who played Sigmund Freud. And I had like a two and a half hour makeup with the hair and the mustache, the aging stuff. And I had to sing, and I am the worst singer. And uh, <laughs> so he, he uh, filmed, I mean, we didn't, uh, we didn't do the ice skating ourselves. Of course, there were doubles. Right. But they were singing, and it was, it was a nice piece. And then he uh, called me a couple of weeks later and said, you know, he looked at it, he doesn't like it. Uh, He's in it, so he must not really like it. <laughs> He's making the he call, right? Yeah. Me, yeah. He wanted me to uh, uh, be in the movie. So he uh, said they're doing the Last Supper scene, and he wants me to play uh, the uh, apostle. And so I played that. And I was right there at the head of the table when Mel comes in, and he and I have a little conversation. And John Hurt played Jesus. And also the fact that I got to be in a, a last, I, I did a last supper scene, a right. picture. You know, they did the classic last supper picture, and I'm in it, and Mel, of course, is standing there as the waiter, you know, with a big smile. But to work with John Hurt was great, and afterwards uh, we had like an adjoining dressing room. And so would you consider out. Mel, was he one of the guys who gave you one of your big breaks when you got out there? I mean, did it make it easier to get other roles well, once he let know, you in? He, with me and at that time it was like you know still peaking and uh yeah it meant a lot but at that point i had already done two of them then he called me for baseball as the the uh of course the jewish plastic surgeon and, and that was well, the all-time classic space balls yes yes <laughs> it was a lot of fun well what are some of your favorite memories from space balls i mean I know some of the funniest things are off camera as opposed to on camera, but I mean, what, what are some of your great memories from that? Well, one of them was uh, towards the end of the scene, uh, my, the scene that I did, uh, as uh, I was walking out, uh, I said to uh, the Rick Moranis character, I said, I'm going to go home and play with my putt. And I hear Mel laughing behind the camera, and he's yelling, cut, cut, cut. <laughs> and he said, great line. And he, uh, when, when they put your, their arm around you and want you to walk with them, it's like, uh-oh. So he <laughs> says, come, walk with me, talk with me. He says, that line, you know, I'm going to go and work on my boss. That's a great line. I said, oh, 
thank you. He said, I'm going to have to give it to Rick Moranis. I said, what? He said, well, and he explained it to me. He said, you know, Rick is the star of the movie. He's the star, he's not you, you, right. you got to give him the last line in the scene. Did you give it to him? So, he didn't give it to him. How, how do you say no to Mel Brooks, right? <laughs> well, but see, then I said, uh, so you owe me one. He said, yeah, you have any ideas? I said, yeah. I said, what about when the camera blacks out? I don't know if you remember that scene, the camera blacks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, movie. I don't know. It just, so when it comes back up, I'm in uh, sort of off to the side. They're making out with the with nurse. With the nurse, yeah. And going at it with her. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and then... Uh, so you came up with that idea? Yeah, of course. Oh, there you I, go. Saying, nah, well, I think I need three to four more times. Let's keep doing this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, he owed you one, right? So there you go. Right, right. He says, I like he says, that's enough. Don't be a pig. <laughs> so you're thinking, man, I'm getting paid to do that. I'm getting paid to make out with this beautiful boy. How'd she feel about it? That's right. Well, I gave you a great joke, you know, so you got to give me something back, you know. And they go, slack in, and I come back. And, uh, but, you know, it just was always, uh, I, Mel is such a good guy. You know, I've run into him a lot. Uh, so was the nurse okay with the whole thing? Was she, she good doing it? She was. I think it was one of her first jobs. She went uh -huh. out to be... Uh, you know, works a lot. Her name is Brenda Strong. She's got uh, quite a, a list of credits. And uh, but look, I, if it was her first movie, it was Mel Brooks, and uh, she knew I knew Mel. And you I do what you're asked to do, right? It's it's not like me too. Like you know, I wasn't grabbing her ass and sticking my. Right, head. right. It was more comical than it was anything like that. Yeah, right? it was. It was nuzzling and things like that, and. Uh, so, yeah, so like I said, I run into him and talk, and he's you knows my kids, and he's invited me to the set. Uh, when we were doing History of the World, he kept inviting me to the set just to be there. He liked uh, me hanging, or he introduced me to Richard Pryor, who was supposed to be in the movie. Really? When he bur so he, bur he brings Richard Pryor to the set, and he called me and said, I'm bringing Richard, why don't you come? Uh, he was that kind of guy, you know. So oh, the number one comedian of all time, Richard. He changed comedy. Oh, I, I was in awe of Richard Pryor. So yeah. I was like the ten-year-old kid walking behind him and Melanie showing him right. the set, the robe and things and stuff like that, because he was going to come in and shoot in a couple of days, and then he burned himself up. Oh, and geez. So, so, so that cost you working with Richard Pryor, then, huh? Job. It was, you know, a tough, a tough shoes to fill. Right, right. How do you fill Richard Pryor's shoes? You do the best you can, right? Yeah, make sure they're not burning. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, you know, he introduced me to all the comics who worked on the movie. He would have me come over and say, today's a good day just to sit and give it to with these guys. And it was, you know, Dom DeLuise and Shecky Green and Ron Carey. And, all the legends. You know, whoever he had in the movie and I would just sit there and kid it with him and uh, it was great. You know, yeah. it was, uh, Those are the moments you remember though, you know, the, the moments off screen are sometimes better than the ones on. Yeah, especially depending on the movie. But, sure. Uh, yeah, I had, you know, I worked with Barbara Streisand. She uh, drove me so crazy that they wound up cutting my scene because... she tough to work with? Pardon me? Is she tough to work with? Uh, for me, it was impossible, but I find out I'm just uh, one of many. She and the director, by this point, were not talking to each other. I had this nice scene with her and Paul McGarry, just the three of us. And so every time the director would give me a certain direction, I'd come in, she'd say, wait, wait, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing what Frank said. She said, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this. I said, well, okay. You're in the middle now. Look out. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. They were shoving me back and forth like a volleyball. Oh. And so uh, uh, I knew even then that there's no consistency here. There's no way they could. Uh, one minute I'm over on the left, another one I'm behind, you know. You're in a no-win situation at that point, right? Right. So uh, I heard now, I didn't know in the DVD version, that that scene is back in. I have to look that up. Really? But... Uh, 
but yeah, she was, you know, she was the boss, and uh, it was a, a tough situation to be in. But look, you know what? I spent the entire day with Barbara. Barbara Streisand, yeah, you survived. That's right. But uh, and, and then she was going to live record a couple songs. I called my wife. Yeah. And we sat in this 2,000 seat theater. It was just me, my wife, and the crew, and she sang Evergreen. And you just got to listen to her sing, right? What a treat! Just to sit there. It was like a private concert to listen to her sing in the front row. Yeah, she she demands big bucks, and you're getting it all for free. Wow. <laughs> That's right. I didn't have to tip anyone, you know. And you know what? At the end of the day, she was uh, sweet. She says, "Yeah, you. things blow over like that in time, right?" Yeah. So one of the other things I wanted to touch on, uh, you know, among a long list of things, and you have your ups and downs in Hollywood. But you were the uh, original Yeoman Gopher on the Love Boat, and then when it became a series, Fred Grandy took over the role. But I mean, w was it tough to you to watch Love Boat after that, or were you a fan of the show? Or no, uh, uh, Love Boat. I, I had just taken over the role when I was married, and that was really uh, probably probably my second job. Because uh, I mean, it went on to be such a hit. Oh, I know. It was a. Uh, they were doing it a two-hour movie of the week, and I went in and out and auditioned. I had a long hair and a beard. They said, you know, "Can you shave the beard and the hair so we can see how you look?" And you know, it was getting closer. And so I finally come back, and I'm sitting on the couch, and there's just one other guy who looks just like me. And they were going to decide today. And uh, you know, I was doing the groundlings on weekends and starting to get some work from that. And so uh, they call him in, and I see he leaves, and they call me in, and I audition again. And so the producer said, do you think the Groundlings could get by without you for a weekend? I said, who? The Groundlings? I don't know who they are. I'm with you guys. And so uh, I got hired on the spot, and uh, we took a cruise to Ensenada, which was really nauseating. Mm -hmm. And it was none of the original crew. Uh, the only one that I I knew was Dick Van Patten. He played the doctor. Right. Both. Yeah. And the other uh, the lead the one was from New York. I didn't know her. One was from Australia. Oh, I did know Teddy Wilson, who played the bartender. He's a terrific actor. And so Isaac. Uh, and, I, and it was Cloris Leachman and Tom Bosley. But I mean, did you what? Did you watch the show after Fred took over the role, or was it just too tough to watch, knowing you could have had? watch it it was like a year later and they call and I'm doing a show for uh, the Mary Tyler Moore company and they asked if I could get out for two weeks to yeah. do another pilot for Love and uh, I was already committed to the show I was a writer and an actor and they were not gonna let me go for two weeks and you know they gave me the old cliche and I had a contract with them. They said, uh, choices uh, to make right <laughs> You'll never work in this town again. Oh, geez. That's the way it goes. And so, and they wound up rehiring the entire crew and staff. Nah, you know what? I have to say, there are other parts. I mean, of course, the money would have been great and right. the exposure. And I don't think it would have been good for well, my no, marriage. And, no, nobody makes uh, every decision right in Hollywood. You know, you make your good decisions, you make your bad ones, and you get by, right? Right, right. And I, again, it wasn't up to me, but there were other things that I almost got, wish I had got, but didn't get, and, but that's the way it is with every actor. Uh, well, let's say, here's a few that you did get, and I'm a comedian, I've done stand-up for 10 years, so, I mean, I chose the the uh, comedian, the comedians you've been a part of, but I'm going to say a name, and just, real quick, nothing long, but just tell me what it was like working with them, uh, Sherman, he Sherman Hemsley of the Jeffersons. Oh, he was a character, uh, I did the show towards the end of the run, probably the 11th season, and so, uh, I, again, uh, the groundlings I got a lot of work without having to audition which was great right. so the producer of one of them had been in the groundlings and knew me from there and they had this role and they just uh, hired me for it and I came in and we did the table read and then we took a break which you usually do and then the assistant director told us all to go home that the uh, actors were not happy with the, the script and they were going to get a new script so uh, a week later, I get a call. They have a new script, 
they want you in that one too. I wound up getting paid uh, doing one show for two shows. So, uh, but Sherman Hemsley was just, because my scene uh, was just with Sherman Hemsley and Franklin Cover. And uh, Sherman Hemsley is just, was just a very funny guy. He seemed like a nice guy, whether it was on screen or off screen. He seemed like a genuine character. Yeah. Yeah, he hung around an interesting crowd. When I was finished, uh, I wanted to go to the dressing room and say goodbye and thanks, and I knocked on the door. It looked like a Marvin Gaye movie in there. It was dark and had all kinds of interesting, shady-looking characters walking around. Really? And, you know, smoke and music. And, <laughs> uh, but you know what? When he had to be on the set for pickup shots, he was right there. He brought it, okay. And, uh, you know what? They were all total pros on that show because they'd been around for a long time, even before the Jeffersons. They were all Broadway stars and all New York actors. Oh, sure, yeah. But Archie uh, Bunker, he was on and everything, yeah. Right, all right. Right. Let's go to uh, Harry Henderson from Night Court. What was he like working with? Oh, Harry Henderson? Yeah. Uh, I actually knew John Larkett before. Uh, I knew John Larkett before. Oh, before you did the show? That was the, that was the first time uh, I had met him or worked with him. Uh, and most of the thing I had was with John uh, Larkett and Marcy Post. Uh, I don't know if you know the episode was John saved Marcy's life. Uh, she was choking and he gave her the Heimlich. Okay. And she said she would do anything to thank him, and of course there was only one thing he wanted to do. <laughs> you know what? You know what John wanted, right? <laughs> yeah, and she finally surrendered, and they go to a hotel. They're ready to go at it, and there's a knocking on the window, and there I am on the ledge. Uh, I was going to jump off uh, the ledge and kill myself, but instead I fucked up uh, his date with her, uh -huh. and uh, I was going to kill myself because. I was a 28-year-old virgin, and so John's character suggested that I should jump. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he said, yes, he he that said, was his character, oh, though, sure. Yeah, he said, don't screw up my action, jump, go ahead, <laughs> you know. And so by the end of the scene, everyone's in the hotel room, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It and I know Harry Henderson, he started out in stand-up comedy as a stand-up comic also. Well, he was... Uh, comic magician. He was really right. a magician. Uh, magic, but he's one of the first guys to like add comedy to it. Add yeah, comedy and magic uh, together, which became a big thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that was, again, I, you know, I love the work and uh, I love depending on the people and so each time I work I just uh, relish it and just enjoy it you know I, I'm not there to look for egos or trouble or, right uh, so, so what about Bob Newhart from the Newhart show now were you on the early in the office days or when he when he owned the inn when he retired yeah, the Newhart I show I was on the, uh, the uh, later one the Newhart show where he owned the uh, the inn in Vermont the there yeah okay yeah yeah you know, that also, again, was uh, terrific. I, uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think I had. I did two episodes in one season, which is pretty unusual. Right. And the first one uh, was uh, the Larry, Daryl, and Daryl were opening a cafe. And I was the first customer. And it, for the character, it was a nightmare. These guys were throwing food at me. It was a great uh, a role for me because I got to do a lot of physical stuff, ducking, mugging, you know. Mm. And uh, so uh, that was, and so they liked it. So they had me come back later in the season. That's uh, when you know you hit it. When they ask you to come back, you know you did your job well, right? Absolutely. So Larry was trying to get his GED. I was his night school teacher, and I wouldn't pass him. And he comes back with Bob, and Bob begs me to retest him because he kept failing. And I said, well, we usually don't do it, but okay. And then Bob asked me one more thing, could you do it like Jeopardy? And uh, so I was asking him, so the question is like, I was asking, giving him the answer, and he was giving me the question. And then they cut to the end of the scene, and I've become, uh, the teacher has totally gotten into being uh, a game show host. And 
I say, like Larry, for a C grade and passing, you know, with the and Willis. And again, it was a lot of fun. Well, his brothers didn't talk. It was only Larry who talked. All right. Uh, the other two were not in that scene. It was just Bob, uh, Larry, right. and me. And huh. uh, I, I, I liked when I get to do those scenes, you know, with three people, get to really work. It's with more them. intimate, right? Yeah. So what was like, let's bring it up to something earlier today, uh, Ed O'Neill from Married with Children. Uh, who didn't remember that one, but uh, what was that like yeah. for you? Uh, you know, there was so, uh, that also was towards the end, I think. There was always just a lot going on on that show. People coming and going and going and coming. And I just never knew exactly what was going on. Yeah, that a big uh, cult following, yeah. You know, I didn't get to, like, really talk to them much or hang out with them. They were just... Because they were at their peak, and so there was, was just stuff going on all the time. And so, uh, but again, you do your job, and uh, they'll be nice to you. You'll be happy, and they'll be happy. And, uh, uh, you know, if you come in there with an attitude or an ego, you're not going to last you know, long, right? Your own show. Right. right? So, uh, so, so I mean. Was, you know, being, being a, uh, you know, a uh, filling actor on those shows to uh, going where you were the star in such movies as Hollywood Nights and Up the Creek, what was it like being the main the main person as opposed to... Well, first it was nice, and uh, in Hollywood Nights, uh, it, was, it, it was a difficult shoot physically, and I don't know, the whole thing was kind of difficult. There was never any script. That's a lot different being the lead man, though, than doing just a scene, right? Right, yeah. You're there for the whole shoot, pretty much. And uh, so we would shoot from 6 in the evening to 6 in the morning. And uh, there was a lot of booze and drugs going on. And it's so, you know, again... It's Hollywood. <laughs> and, yeah, and so we had to sort of uh, do what we could do ourselves. And we didn't get much help from the director and... It's amazing that anything cohesive even turned out. But uh, so yeah, it physically was tough because you get home at six and then you'd have to try and sleep half the day. And, but uh, it was fun, but it was difficult because nobody was keeping track of where we were shooting. You know, it was. Uh, it's a lot more work too. Oh, it is. Everybody sees the fun that goes into acting; they don't realize how much work goes behind it, though. That's right. It's uh, look. Otherwise, anybody could do it. Right, right. Which, um, which is what my which is what my father thought when I started working as an actor. He called me and he was going to send my two brothers out. Uh, he wanted me, my younger brothers to. He said, "Listen, if you could be on the television, imagine how terrific they would be." Oh, well, he thought anybody so, could do it, right? <laughs> Not that easy. Yeah, and he did, and they came out, and uh, it didn't work out for them. Right. You know, they they. Uh, my father, uh, I was raised poor. My father became very successful. So my two younger brothers were raised uh, affluent. And uh, they, their mentality was entitlement. And they thought, well, uh, they were going to work for my father. He just put them in. So mm -hmm. they had the same mentality that uh, included my father. They can come out to L.A. and I can push them into movies and TV. Just push them in. You know? Right. It, it don't work, work like that. that. Now, so the two of them uh, eventually left and uh, uh, went back to Ohio where they belonged. All right, uh, so... Up the, creek, up the Creek was a lot of fun. You know, I, I, I have a good time when uh, we were in Oregon for three months and the first uh, two weeks, my team, which was Tim Matheson and Dan Monahan from Porky's and Stephen First from... Uh, uh, from Animal House. You're working with all the legends. And, yeah, and Tim knew how to raft, of course, but I didn't, neither did Steven, so they were going to teach us. And uh, I was scared to death. I mean, I was ready to quit, but they said, hey. So after I finally took that first rafting ride down the river, I loved it. And, when they, and then when we got ready to shoot, our team was the first one up. They had four cameras set up along the river. And they were just going to film us rafting down the river. And we were so good and so slick. The director yelled, cut. And he came over to us. He said, what are you guys doing? 
He says, you're supposed to be the bad team, the terrible team. <laughs> you're doing too good, right? <laughs> yeah, he said, you look like an Olympic team coming down there. He said, be bad. So we did it again, and then we were, you know, like quacking uh, oars and waving oars in the air. And that's what they were looking for, right? That's what they wanted, and that's what they got. All right, so... Uh, so I got a, uh, I got a sponsor here on uh, Funny Like a Callum podcast. I got to mention them real quick, but it's uh, G Vegas Buffalo Sauce for the sweet, spicy, savory taste at game time. There's only one G Vegas. So, do you like buffalo wings, Sandy? Oh, yeah. I'm a big buffalo wing guy myself. So, if you got the call tomorrow, if they called you up and said, there's going to be a space balls too, are you in or are you out? I'm already standing in line. I've been there for. Uh forever to do uh you, so you you, but, you know I, I don't know if mel will do it well it's not your choice but if you got the call you'd be in because i don't know are you retired now are you semi-retired or no no not at all you know man you know as you get a little older uh things tend to slow down because uh some of the bigger names that wouldn't do the parts that I did will do them now because they're not getting as much as work. As much work, right? So you sort of get, you get dropped down on the food chain. Down the shuffle, right. So, well, I know later on in your career, uh, you and your wife, Harriet, you wrote episodes for The Golden Girls, Perfect Strangers, Dear John, Harry and the Hendersons. So what was it like for you right. to shift from being in front of the camera to behind the camera? of myself because when you improvise you sort of write uh, you don't write it down but it's coming from your head and uh, uh, so the writing was you know, I mean the first writing job we had professional was the hundredth episode of the Golden Girls wow was, <laughs> there's something to live up to right <laughs> it's what that's something to live up to right gee that's a lot of pressure on a hundredth episode yeah And we couldn't believe it. And then I panicked. I said, We got now, we got to write this shit, you know. And it was a good episode. And like every other TV show, you know, every script is rewritten. That's why they have a staff of 10 writers. In to, uh, so everyone had Everybody to gets their writer. idea in there, right? Right. But, you know, it's still your script and your name is on it. And, well, and what one's more difficult, being an actor in front of the camera or being behind the camera and making sure everything goes right in writing? The writing is honestly, especially we were freelance. Once you freelance uh, and you turn in the script, you come and you watch the show, uh, and that's it. You have really no input. You know? Right. Your last, the last of your input is when you turn in the script, and they uh, spend a week rewriting it. They they rewrite while they're on the floor, shooting it, changing things, moving things around. But we had two very funny stories, and you know it was the uh, for the first professional writing job, it was like a, a dream to sure. be there and hear them saying our words and acting out uh, our stories, and uh, uh, we were just thrilled, you know, we were thrilled. So, uh, yeah, they were good stories. And if it, uh, the two stories were, one was uh, where they thought uh, Dorothy had been switched at birth with this Italian family, and uh, Rose and... Uh, uh, I can't remember uh, the other one's name. Rose and the Betty White. The <laughs> one. No, no, it was Betty White and uh, the I don't know. Anyhow, they were taking dirty dancing classes, oh. and so to see them dirty dance together was at that age, exciting. right? <laughs> yeah, especially at that age. So. Uh, but it's good to stay connected to the business, whether you're writing or acting, or you're in the business doing what you love, right? Proud, yeah. Uh, you know. So I got one question for you. It's an off the wall question, but every time I Googled you, uh, Sandy Helberg, uh, Simon Helberg would come up too, who's a uh, member of the Big Bang Theory. Is, is there any relation between you two, or is just a last name coincidence yeah. that you know of? Uh, no, it's just my birth. Uh, he's our son. 
Oh, he's your son. Yeah, he's our son. Oh, I had no idea. So your son is Simon Helberg on the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, he's our oldest son. Oh, I, I did not know that. Now I okay. So you're his dad. Okay. So what's it like having your son follow on in your tradition? Well, it was uh, you know at first we were surprised because he wanted to be a musician, an amazing musician. Really? I don't know. He did he did a movie last year and he performed with uh, Meryl Streep. And uh, he uh, played a pianist. She did that movie, Florence uh, uh, Henderson. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, he worked with Meryl Streep for three months, and uh, he played the piano with her and practiced. They rehearsed together. But you know, uh, you want uh, to, you want your kids to be successful. But this is out of fucking. Had, had he ever? Did he ever ask you for advice or anything? Or? beginning, you know, we hooked him up uh, with his first agents, and whatever we could do, we did, and uh, he wanted to go to NYU, we sent him to NYU, and uh, uh, so, you know, uh, sometimes it, it is a matter of luck, I did half a dozen pilots, including Wellboat and these other ones, and uh, he did a couple pilots when this one got picked up, and the rest is history. Now, now you'd probably never ask, but has he, has he ever hinted around as maybe having you a guest on the Big Bang Theory? Yeah, well, that's not up to him. See, he's only an actor. He's a, a hired hand. Otherwise, he would have had his wife on the show. By well, well, I don't know. Well, the other guy who plays Leonard there, he he was on the Roseanne Bar show, and he brought a lot of his friends from the Roseanne show on, so... Uh, yeah, but also <laughs> the producer worked on the Roseanne show, so he's... Oh, the, so the producer he's had more to do with it. Really The number one show on TV. You can't get any better than that, right? Yeah, and so I think this is the last season, and then uh, you know uh, he's got a few bucks, and so it'll be interesting to see what he, where he goes. Yeah, from where, where he goes from here, right? Well, let's leave it off on this, Sandy. I mean, I thank you for being on the show, but you're a veteran of the veteran actors. Uh, your resume is endless. Uh, if there were some young actors out there right now and they were listening to the podcast and they said you know sandy give us some advice what advice would you have for the young actors coming up go home <laughs> forget about it <laughs> now, now you know what uh hopefully you're there uh about the work and not about stardom and not about because i i still hear so many actors say oh i can't be a star then you, then you should go home uh, you should know about your craft, study, and work as much as you can. I don't even mean look, it's hard to get professional work, but I did tons of uh, showcases, free shows, classes, workshops. You need to sort of, you need to keep yourself active. And uh, then there's the other thing, which is luck. That's something you can't That's control. a part of it, yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, when you do start to work, you better be prepared better uh, know what you're doing otherwise that'll be the end of it you know uh, everyone has to show up to work ready and know what they're doing and know how to do it uh, uh, people don't want to pay for your uh, education on the set right so don't get discouraged so, don't give up and be ready that's right don't give up be ready be good be the best you can all right. Well, I'm ready for a lot more great guests like you on Funny Like a Clown podcast. Sandy, I thank you so much for being a guest, and great luck in the future, and thank you for all the acting and memories you've gave us. Well, thank you very much, and it was a lot of fun doing the show. All right. We'll catch up with you soon, Sandy. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Veteran actor right there, Sandy Helberg. And, boy, the shows he was on, I'd love to be on one of those shows. And he had a resume like... Uh, crazy and apparently runs in the family because who knew who knew his son was simon helberg of the big bang theory now we know that a lot of talent in that family man good stuff all right until next time i bid you a farewell and uh i hope you tune us in again i'm dennis worth good night